start somewhere very pleased to have Shmuel Fishman from the Technion uh, Department of Physics. And he's going to tell us about Anderson localization for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation and some uh, new ideas on scale. Yeah, so it's my great pleasure to thank you for inviting me here. And um, now, uh, this, uh, well, uh, I will, in, uh, so the talk will be, most of it will be a blackboard talk, as you are used to. Now, uh, it's just the introduction that I will give with uh, these uh, transparencies. Now, uh, for people that don't know me, I'm not a mathematician. And uh, uh, so no, nothing what uh, here will be, what I was doing will be rigorous, but... Um, uh, now, so, uh, so I will start with a with few transparencies, basically trying to, motivo to motivate uh, the issue and showing graphs. Then I will uh, go to explain what we did actually on the blackboard. So what we are looking at uh, under the sun localization for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation with uh, with this order, and now I will describe numerical results that was done that was done by different groups, and then I will describe a scaling theory that was developed by Arkady, by Arkady Pikovsky and myself. Now, this, the experimental relevance of this system is to nonlinear optics, where the wave function, uh, where the, actually the electric field uh, of the light plays the role of the wave function, and the propagation direction plays the role of time. And there, the nonlinear equation, uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation is a good approximation, but it's not uh, the exact equation. And both Einstein condensates in the uh, mean field description, what's known as the gross pitayevsky equation. And it's not clear w that with randomness, it will be a good description for the system. But anyhow, we will look, we will look also at very long time limits where they are very far from what one can do in experiment. So that's basically a fundamental problem. So I consider it and think about it as a fundamental problem that's motivated by experiment. At the moment, we cannot say to which experiment it will be relevant. Uh, so, uh, and the, so this is basically the motivation to of the, for the problem. And the outline will be after uh, a, a short uh, introduction, and it, it is a very short, I will start to show numerical results. And the people that did the numerics produce also some theoretical argument to explain them. And I will try to uh, de describe them. Then I will describe the scaling theory. And then I will summarize the results. Uh, so, uh, when, when we look at this nonlinear and the nonlinear Schrodinger equation that is defined in this way, where H0 is some Hamiltonian of the linear problem, <coughs> and there are two versions. One is the lattice version that I will take care of, and, uh, and the other is the continuum version, where it uh, is part of the motivation. Now, for uh, the Basically, now, if V is random, H0 is just the Anderson model. And for this model, we know if there is, uh, if, if, if basically, if there is no nonlinearity, we know that in one dimension, all the states are localized uh, in, in the continuum version and in the discrete version. Now, if we switch off the randomness, the uh, the continuum version without randomness is an integrable problem. There, uh, uh, there are enough integrals of motion, so this mo the system is integrable, and we know what happens, and it depends on the, basically on the sign of the nonlinear term. That's very important. O on the lattice, the sign is not important, because in different parts of the band, the effective mass can change sign. So this, and this is something... So your randomness is in the the epsilon x, or epsilon x, is a random function. 
And, and, and you're assuming independence? Y yes. I assume that uh, on the lattice, it's very easy to formulate. For each, uh, the, the variables on all the axes are independent random variables. And they are bound. And, and in all the numerical experiments, what is assumed, that it's just it's the Anderson model, where if epsilon is smaller than something, uh, uh, then you have the se uh, some probability. If it's larger than something, the probability is zero. So this is the model that will be used, the simplest model. Uh, and now, if uh, uh, so, this is the simplest model with this epsilon. Now, uh, when we started to look at it, uh, then uh, the naive argument was that this should obviously localize. And why should it be localized? Let's assume it does not. So you there is spreading. And if there is spreading, this term becomes small. Because by th this equation conserves both the norm and the uh, energy. So this term becomes small. So it, uh, so it should be negligible. And then, in the end, you get localization. Because what, no what we know about Anderson theory. Now, and uh, then people, now the first one, to start to do numerical calculation of this was Dima Shepeliansky, and he was doing it on the kick throttle. <coughs> and, <if coughs> and you find when you add there a nonlinear term, something different happens. And then he repeated it in this model, and he found that also something different happens. And he, he and did not see localization. Right? Pardon? He did not see the localization. No, he didn't see localization. He was seeing spreading, and he claimed that there is a threshold in beta. Uh, well, uh, uh, well, there are some people in our audience who don't know what the lo what localization means, so maybe you could just s say write a time-dependent version of it or whatever, so they okay. understand what it means about, about the wave packet spreading and not spreading. Okay. Well. Well, localization means that uh, uh, if this is the system, and okay, so first of all, for the wave function, it means that for nearly all the potential, I will say it in a loose, non-rigorous way, that for nearly all the potentials, the wave functions look, look exponentially localized. Now this is, this is a log of psi square, and this is position x. Now, if you have, uh, and now if I prepare a, a, a wave packet, this in implies th that if you prepare a localized wave for packet, it will not spread. And the reason is that assume <coughs> that we have states that are lo localized in different places. And now this is a linear problem. So what we learned is that if we want to calculate the evolution, we write psi of x of t as a function as a sum of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with expansion coefficients. So a n e to the i e n t, let's assume Planck's constant is 1, uh, and uh, u n that are time independent eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. Now, if the eigenfunctions are localized, so, so now what, uh, what, what uh, should I do? I am given psi of x and 0, and I use it to calculate the expansion coefficient. So if uh, these wave functions are localized, uh, so the, the wave functions are living everywhere. And then I look, so, I, so now I start with a wave packet that, uh, that say is here. So then I, I look at which wave function have a large overlap, and this will determine the a ends. So so it's this or this. So then, no matter how long, and the rest are negligibly small. So no matter how long I wait, this wave function will move around here. And it will be localized. So, the, so showing that the states are, uh, are localized Im implies localization. Now, none of these states, now the localization land, I don't want to enter into subtle problem that the localization land will go for some states to infinity. Uh, but if it is bounded, as is the case of this problem, that's what happens. Is that clear? So there's no spreading. There's no spreading. 
Due to the randomness, there is no spreading. So it means, and then this is now, this is a remarkable phenomenon. If you take, say, this is a tight binding model. Now, if you take a continuous potential, what will happen is that you have a potential that looks like this, and you have a wave packet uh, with an, uh, that uh, most of its energy is higher than all the barriers it will be reflected with probability 1. So this is, the, this is the remarkable phenomenon of quantum mechanics. And if you, prepare, uh, if you prepare a wave packet in the place where all the states are localized, uh, it will actually uh, stay trapped, not by potential, but by scattering. And actually, it is used today in optics in something that is called random lasing. So this is, these are lasers that you take a random active material and instead of mirrors you use Anderson localization uh, to, to, keep, uh, to, uh, to keep the radiation inside. So the cavity is just by, by this and, and this is actually the only way that you can have light localized in real space. Uh, and, and now uh, second, now, un, now as the introduction part, uh, or Anderson introduced localization, basically uh, the problem that motivated was uh, elec electrons in dirty superconduct uh, semiconductors. Uh, and uh, however, with electrons there are interactions. So actually the cleanest uh, realizations are in optics. Okay, so... Uh, Well, you, there are different models. Depends you, on the preparation. Well, so, Anderson didn't care about the one-dimensional model at all. Well, Anderson in this paper mentions all dimensions. So it's a roadmap. It means he had in mind three dimensions, but, yeah. but he talks about the dimensionality. And I, if I remember correctly, it says that when the dimension will be sufficiently low, uh, the, uh, the, and then there is the gang of 40 that basically uh, gave uh, uh, an, uh, an, uh, a heuristic argument why also in two dimensions all the states are localized. So, uh, so this is, and now the question is, now in optics then the question will be if you make uh, the, if take a dielectric with a sufficiently strong uh, amplitude with sufficiently strong intensity, then the dielectric constant depends on the intensity and, and, and then will this destroy localization. So that is uh, this, this, this is the nonlinearity that, uh, that appears in this. Now, and the lowest order is of the nonlinearity if you, and the point, uh, the kernel linearity is exactly of this form. However, the nice experiments are done not with the kernel linearity. So in some way, we think about it as a paradigm. So we, saw, we look at this equation. We believe that we want to study as a competition between wave effects and nonlinearity. OK? So uh, basically, so this is, uh, uh, so this is, so, so this is the question that we want to look at. And this competition, and now, so there are numerical simulations, and let me tell you what uh, is characteristic of them. It means, uh, uh, first of all, they, they can go for uh, times that are much longer than real experiments. Second, uh, there's, uh, uh, people looked at long, uh, spreading for a long time, and these are the various groups. Now, the problem is, it's not clear, uh, the problem usually when we do uh, in f simulations to study physics, we, we know about some scale. So we decide when is infinite, when, when the system is infinite. For example, critical phenomena, we say, well, if the system is much larger than the correlation length, uh, then, uh, then it's infinite. Here, we don't know what the scale is. So we don't know what is a very long time or very large system. So uh, basically, the simulations stop when they don't have more, um, basically, resources. And, uh, and, uh, and now all results 
that nearly all results that we know were done e use the split step method. So the split step method is basically that you t take a small time interval and you have only the kinetic energy, only the hopping term, and then in another part you have only the onside term, and then you play with these intervals, and none of these, and, and there is really no control on these results because, for example, um, because the system I was discussed is chaotic, basically what happens is you don't really find the solution of the equation. Uh, be, uh, be, for example, if you integrate and integrate back, you will not return to the same function. This is something that is checked for the systems. So what the control is, they change the sign time of the step and they look if the average quantities are uh, come out con co in some way consistent. So they, they check the optimum. The, the L2 norm, the L2 norm there is built in so it's conserved. It, it's built in the algorithm. And energy is also conserved? Yes, it's also built in the, uh, in the algorithm. So, uh, so, so these algorithms, because you, because you replace it by another unitary system. And um, then it is supported by you some heuristic arguments that I will tell them briefly and then because I, there is no otherwise uh, but the, and, and afterwards if there will be time I will uh, uh, explain them more carefully. So these are typical simulations. So what you do is you prepare it. Now this is uh, these are the sites. This is the log of the wave function squared and basically uh, you, you integrate it with time the time step, time, is measured in natural units of the system that is basically the inverse of the bandwidth. Now, uh, so first of all, we see f uh, that up to time that is 10 to the 5, these two curves, one is with linearity and the other is with non-linearity, and you don't see the difference. If you go, however, so to... non-linearity looks irrelevant here, right? On that scale. But now you wait longer, other three orders of magnitude, and this is what you find. So there's a flat region here, and then if you change a bit, the, you change the strength of the disorder, you see a larger flat region. So this is strong disorder, weak disorder, weaker disorder. But what is characteristic is now that this falls off exponentially, and falling off. What's the difference in the, what's the difference in the different colors now? The different colors. Okay, so here is the color code. Uh, the, the, this, co this color is beta equals to zero. Beta is what? Beta is the that's strength the of the nonlinearity. Okay, so that's the linear model. This is the linear model, and it's exponential. Yes. The red is 10 to the 5 steps, time steps for the nonlinear model. For the nonlinear, you, you have the linearity and both, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And this is 10 to the 8. Looks like it's starting to spread. It starts to spread, and it's spreading a, the characteristic spreading. There is a flat region, and there is exponential fall off. Yes, velocity. And then, uh, and this is the, the, the exponential fall off is as of the linear problem. Now, uh, the same happens on a for, for a very long time for the Fermi Ulam pasta problem. So the Fermi Ulam pasta problem is a problem of coupled oscillators. And it was simulated first. The great surprise was that it doesn't thermalize. But now, having computers that run longer, it starts to thermalize after a long time scale that no one understands. And uh, in the Fermi Ulam pasta problem, the spreading looks different. This part gets chopped off, where instead of sight is the normal mode. So here is the puzzle to understand how it works. And then, well, uh, could, you, could you write down? Could, uh, could you write down what, what, what Shabelyansky and other people were, are saying about the spread? Uh, how x squared of t? In a moment, okay. it is here. Okay, good. So what they measure is x squared, and this is some of the stuff of Shapelyansky and company, and this is of uh, basically of Flach and company, and the way. Uh, so this is these are averages. Uh, of um, many realizations. Here, you look on specific realizations. 
So what you see, that it that's, uh, and the, the different colors are different values of, uh, of the beta that is the strength of the nonlinearity. And what you see here is that for really weak nonlinearity, uh, you see that it does not spread, there is a jump, and this jump happens at a different time at each realization. So you average over many realizations, you don't have much information. And uh, so this is the puzzle, and then the, now the question is, what is the law that all of them say? Well, the law of all of them is that this goes x square now. Uh, the simulations, the most extensive simulations, uh, that is of the Flach, the Dresden group, said it's a third. Now, the first uh, simulations of Shepelyansky were showing two fifths, and he had a theory with two fifths. Uh, I'm not sure. So, some of the first simulations, the computer, the, it was not the, the main important thing of this work was to draw the, to draw the attention. I'm not sure that he insists now on this exponent. So, are you, they are going the other way. I mean, this, is a, this is not localization, it's diffusion. Yeah, diffusers, yes. So, this is still, we are still talking about the same, the same equation? Yep. It's the same equation, yes. <laughs> so, it's the same, <laughs> no, 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 okay, no, no. This was, uh, no, this was the linear equation. No, well, no, the non the nonlinear equation, this is what they find. In the different of yes. For small beta, you get for small beta it's a, a for short time, it doesn't, it doesn't start to diffuse. But then. No, but uh, when beta is small, what is the exponent in the limit you're getting there? In, uh, well, this is. Uh, f well, the claim is, the claim is that the exponent does not depend on beta. So this is the claim. And however, you can see it only for some range of beta. Because if beta becomes very small, they run for 10 to the 9 iterations, and they see nothing. It can take a long time for the yes. atomic yes. to kick in. Yes. What is the difference between one third and two fifths? It's one group of yeah. different, yeah. Different, people. Different, people. different people. Different people. Different people. This was earlier, and uh, with less time steps, with less precision, this was later. Pardon? But show me a replace of beta by potential in X. In okay. So okay. So this is what you are doing. Did you you, so you replace it by x to beta so is proportional to one over x to the tau. Small tau. Small tau. So then, then it's possible, I mean, as a, as a mathematical result, to prove that uh, this is not no, you're not correct. That, that this will not happen. T to the epsilon. Pardon? T to the epsilon. It the is t to the epsilon. The epsilon is arbitrarily small. Epsilon depends on tau. So, so, wait, so, so, so you say mathematically uh, it will be t to the epsilon. <laughs> <laughs> but that's with no disorder. No, no, the with, with disorder, with disorder. It's with disorder. With disorder. But the, but the, but the beta. Yes, decreases. The be decreases, and the, so the disorder becomes more pronounced. So, so this is t to the. Uh, so so beta Okay, tau is arbitrarily small, so tau goes to zero, and epsilon, yeah, epsilon the, is uh, and epsilon yeah, can be arbitrary. So, 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 so you, when you fix tau, uh, epsilon can can become as small as you wish. Yeah, but so now you have to specify the initial data to be within some. The initial data you start from one point, okay. one point. So then, then, so you say the, that there is, it's, it's beta one over x to the power of two times a small factor. Uh, okay. 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 Constant. And that small factor is going to depend on epsilon. On epsilon Which of that I want of the spread. This is the best mathematical result. It's That's an upper bound. It's an upper bound on x squared. So okay. So if this is the case, 
there is an epsilon, and the epsilon is a function of tau. Epsilon is, uh, is a bit. So if you fix no. me an epsilon and yes. tau, okay, yes. arbitrarily small, yes. and you put this constant c there sufficiently small, So this is this is an absolute uh, constant. Time, right? There's no time restriction. No time restriction. Yes, of uh, for a simple uh, yeah. This is the big machine. I mean, it's normal form. Okay. It so this is what normal form form transformation. Be happy to go beyond that thing. So that seems compatible with, with these things. Uh, well, I don't know. I would say not. I don't know. Well, no, no. it's Does this have no a result no. For tau equals zero, you don't have a result for tau. No, the, 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 no. no. This is the point. So okay. yeah, I would not say, but. The whole thing is to be able to close that scheme you were explaining, right. explaining in the beginning. Yes. If you knew it well decaying a little bit, it would be in business. Yes. So there were that this exponent is decaying. I know. I'm talking about the, the state, the, the solution. If you knew that the state would be decaying at infinity, the, okay. It's not the really a term would be perturbation of that kind, right? Okay. So okay. I don't, I don't quite understand. So if if uh, uh, I have this result, now here beta is decaying, while he, th there beta is fixed. Yes, but, but he's saying the eff it effectively decays because okay. it's spread out. Okay, okay. So you say, okay, so if... That's the, that's the point. So the point is that if the... I, uh, that I can in some way iterate it. So it spreads, then I will start, yeah. I will dec decide that these are yeah. my new initial conditions, and then you say this cannot be an asymptotic result. No, no but I can't, I can't do this iteration, I can only do what I'm telling you yeah. there, but I can't uh, go beyond that. Okay. That's it. Okay. I don't think there's any contradiction. But okay, so. Okay, uh, anyhow, so now th so these people uh, were t trying to justify this result in, in to produce some theory that will produce this result. And this is what I call, they didn't call this, I called it effective noise theory. And uh, it, uh, the ideas appear in their papers, but so you start with, you expand the wave function in terms of the angle functions of the linear model. Now the expansion coefficients are now time dependent. And then the, the equations, they satisfy these equations. You can, this is easy to see. Then V is the overlap integral. It basically, it, it's given by quantities of the linear model. It's the overlap of these four functions. And therefore, it's something local, because the, the centers of localization of these functions have to be close one to the other. Uh, otherwise, it is very small, because these functions decay exponentially. So then, what they say is basically, now you, you want to model the central region that, I, uh, that was uh, here. Remember, there was a central region that was like this. The log. Uh, this is the log of psi square. So you want to measure how this gets spread to here, how this gets spread to here. So what they say is that the you take the C, these C's belong to functions in the center. And you assume they are roughly the same. And then the, the combination of them, they say, is basically a random function of time that decays like white noise. Then if you do that, and now you ask, how does the CN that belongs to a state living near the edge, how does it uh, change uh, with time? And then you. You, you, you substitute uh, you, all this, you replace by some white noise, and then you work out how this changes. You assume that this looks like a thermal distribution. This point equilibrizes. I will be happy to describe it afterwards. From that, the co and now, and they assume that not all the modes take part in this spreading, 
they, they, well, they play with the number of modes. There is no really good, good theory. Yeah. And then they get this exponent of a third. And now, if one plays a different way with these modes, you get a half. So this is, and then they now, uh, so there are several points they still have to show. I will not be able to go to the details of this because otherwise I would not, uh, I would not succeed. And then basically the crucial assumption is that this, this time correlation function the basically uh, is, uh, is, is basically a delta function in time, or it's something that decays sufficiently fast, and no one checked it. This is the F is, is the left-hand side equation. So you assume that instead of the real stuff, you have I DDT of the expansion coefficients, and instead of the real expression, you write a function uh, that is some function of parameters times f of t, that uh, when f of t is a random function of time that decays very fast. It's a delta function. And uh, very fast in, in, in time. In terms of time correlation. correlation. Yes, time correlation, yes. So correlation decays sufficiently fast. And if this does not work, uh, you cannot get that result. So uh, now no one checked that this is this it really. Delta. It just has to be rapidly. It has to wrap, it has to decay faster than any power law. Because otherwise you will, you will, you will get a wrong result for the diffusion. You will not get a third. Any faster than any, no, it has to be, no, the integral, the integral have to be, to be the, the integral has to converge. The integral has to converge, it will be a convergent number. So it is a correlation that allows the diffusion process. So they only do this in the central region, they don't do it in the tail? No, they do it, they describe it, they say, okay, only the modes that live here affect this stuff here. The last and they one. But pardon? The last one on the edge of the... The last one, region. nearly there. The no, the, uh, the other one, they don't claim that it's what happens. So they claim they will get the wrong result if they do it. So, the, so what they do is, then they say, okay, the next step, the, it will look like this, the next step, it will look like this. Well, no, but how did, it, how did the tail move out? Well... The tail can't move out unless... Yeah, right. Yeah. But that's what they say. So yeah, this is what... I, I, I explain I, how the tail moved out. I, I, this is... Well, they don't explain... They don't write... In, they never write it in this way. This is what I understand from the papers, because if you write it in this way, in some way, you have to check it. And now they never checked such things. And uh, so it may be... And they never now... And this theory has predictions also how these coefficients will depend on various parameters. And this was not checked. So there, there was no consistent check of this theory. So this is basically... And, uh, and then the question is, can it move forever? So for example, if all over the whole region, the stuff that will be in one localization length will be very small, and there will be roughly one mode. Will you be able to say, to say that it's like random noise? Probably not. So, so then the question is, is there a mechanism for this to die out? And uh, the point when you try to look at it, uh, and I will not be able time to discuss it, uh, but I will be happy to discuss it with everyone, it looks that if you run for a very long time, so if yeah, after a time that goes like the localization length to a huge power the around 12 or something like that, then all this will die out. And, but you cannot do the numerical calculation because then you, you have to go, now you can say, okay, we'll take a very small localization length, but then you don't see it in the in numerical experiment starting to grow up. So, uh, so, so this is the point with this theory. So with Arkady Pikovsky, we decided to do something else and, and to construct a theory only for the central region. So to say, is uh, we take a finite chain and we ask, is uh, will this uh, will chaos be supported? So we don't ask uh, about spreading, but w what will be the probability of being chaotic? And we do it only numerically. We don't have any good theory for this, but we hope uh, that uh, this is at least consistent. So, the, so what is the problem that we try to solve? There is a competition. You, when you spread, effectively, more degrees of freedom get excited. So that enhances chaos. 
However, the amplitude goes down. So, chaos, so it suppresses chaos. And the question, who wins? And this is something that we cannot guess. This is something that I think we have to do a calculation to do. And then, so here, so from here I have the choice that I was thinking, also I will explain you what we calculate, and from, there, from here I will start to do it on the blackboard the way that you like usually in such seminars. So, uh, so this is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Now the beta disappeared, but it, it will be replaced by the initial amplitude of the wave function. Then, uh, what we now compare to the uh, initial equation, we rescale j goes like 1 plus w, and epsilon goes from j uh, minus jw. So the linear part, the localization is trivially rescaled. So the localization length will not change by this. However, the scale of energy will change. The nonlinear part is is rescaled basically by 1 plus w. So w is large or small? We will, no. We, will, we, want to, uh, the, the, we want to build a theory for all w's. However, numerically, we will uh, we'll test it only for w large. So I could take j equals 1? You can take j, j equals 1. I think you should be able to take j equals 1. And epsilon is of basically of the order of 1. Yeah, D, yes, you can, but now we will, our theory we claim should probably apply, but we will not be able to check it. So we'll check it numerically only for large W, because we don't have an infinite computer. So what we do is, uh, so we'll construct a scaling theory, we'll determine one end of a scaling curve, and we'll show you that's a scaling curve, then we will say, well, if nothing strange happens, you can go with it to infinity. This what the this what actually what the gang of four did. So the localization length of the linear piece is basically of the order of one, right? One. So it is that most three. Otherwise, we run out of the computer uh, to check it. It means we can we have the theory, but then it's a question of faith if you believe us. But f we check it only for uh, for for W that is large. Mm -hmm. And now we treat it as a dynamical system. Well, these are the variables. We take, uh, and then there are L variables. And uh, then what we measure is the Lyapunov exponent, the, the largest Lyapunov exponent. And what we say if uh, periodic, boundary conditions, periodic boundary conditions. Periodic boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. And we check the largest Lyapunov exponent. And, uh, the, and we ask, what is the probability that the largest Lyapunov exponent is 0? On the computer, it's not zero. It's a small number that we will decide arbitrarily. But then we ask, what is the largest Lyapunov exponent? And then if the largest Lyapunov exponent is larger than zero, we say the system is chaotic. And, and it, I, wish I should emphasize, or you want to emphasize here, that, that there are really L Lyapunov exponents. Yes, there are L Lyapunov exponents. There is a whole system. There is a whole system, and the, yeah, e the, is the easiest to calculate is the largest one. Because what you do is, is you measure stretching. You do, for people that know it, it's a standard technique. It's called the tangent map. And you integrate it. And you don't really have to solve the system correctly if it's chaotic to know the large Lyapunov exponent. Let me see. It, it, so, so to get a positive Lyapunov exponent, you need a nonlinearity, right? Sure. Otherwise, it's a linear system. And, uh, and uh, it, it, it is zero, of course. You need a nonlinearity, but having nonlinearity does not assure you. Uh, no, and okay. also, also, this truncated system is Hamiltonian. The energy is conserved, and the norm is conserved. OK? And now this uh, is that, uh, what we do. We basically uh, measure here the, uh, basically, the the, 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 the log of the Lyapunov number. And what we check is when the Lyapunov exponent becomes, uh, basically, if the Lyapunov exponent becomes uh, small, we beyond this green line, we assume that it is 0. Because also, our computer runs for a finite time. But, but let me just ask, what, what's a bit strange is that you, can, you restrict to 0 L and, and not to minus L L. Well, it doesn't matter. 
No, 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 not at zero. Our initial data, okay, a good point. Our initial data now is uniformly spread over the chain. Okay, pardon? Rho, okay, rho is basically size squared. So it's a density. Okay, so we do it for various densities, and at some stage, if and now what we checked so far, now we run it to 10 to the 6 iterations, uh, no, 10 to the 6 time steps of the system. So, and then we, we, as a control, we run it afterwards to 10 to the 7 to see that nothing uh, strange happens. And this is something that we'll have to check at some stage. And what this is a test that if the Lyapunov exp one, another way to see chaos, that if you, uh, to what, uh, what is the quality of reversal to the initial condition? So you see if the Lyapunov exponent is that, is that small, when you do the reversal experiment, you return, in the, in the, there's no chaos. The, the arrow in the, uh, basically the accuracy is, is excellent. You come back. You come back. So this is a consistency test of the numerics. After how long? 10 long to the 6. Mm -hmm. You'd run 10 to the 6, you turn 10 to the 6 back, and you return. And so if the system is not, it does not turn chaotic, although it's nonlinear, it works. Next. So now, okay, now maybe we'll switch to the blackboard. If you like it. The question is, when do I have to finish? Well, you should finish at around 5 o'clock. Around 5 o'clock. So then, the introduction was very long. So now... That's, that's, <laughs> always, that's always as it should be. <laughs> uh, so then, maybe we'll do the following. We'll see how m I will try to use transparencies. And then, if, you d if something will not be clear, we'll go to the two sides of the blackboard. Otherwise, it's simply... Uh, will not will not finish. So what we do is the following: we divide the system into small boxes of the size L zero that are larger than the localization length, much larger than the localization. Than the localization of the, of the linear, linear problem. Yeah. And then uh, we ask the following question: uh, Now we connect the boxes, and now for a system to be regular, it should not be chaotic at any point. So we say, OK, we take these boxes. And then we say the probability this, uh, that this enti entire block will be regular, we need all the small boxes to be, re to be regular. And therefore, the probability. Regular, you should say what regular means. Regular means zero Lyapunov exponent. Zero Lyapunov. Yes. Regular is zero Lyapunov exponent. So then we say, uh, the, uh, we assume that the boxes are independent. So then there is no chaos in any of the boxes. And what then what it means that this probability is the product of the probabilities. So because there are L over L zero boxes. So if there are L over L zero boxes, so then uh, so, 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 we, so, and so then what it means that the boxes are in some way non-interacting. Well, now here uh, the notation is now, the probability is a function of the density, of the strength of the disorder, of the length. There is nothing more. And the strength, uh, the, uh, the, uh, and now the density is basically the norm over the length. And this, so this probability is the probability in the space of, of randomness and the potentials. Is that correct? The probability, yes. So what we do, it's a way. It, it's a, what we do is basically uh, we, we count for, for each realization. You do this numerical experiment, and you count how many realizations uh, satisfy this. And then, if this is correct, now you can take the L power. And then what it means that the L power of, uh, of this uh, is basically independent of L, if this is correct. So now we'll have to check it. It means For so L up to a certain L, too small. L, L has to be larger than L0, much larger than the localization length. So, and then. When you do your sampling, do you look also at many initial conditions for a given sample? No, it means all the initial. Okay, this is a point that we'll have to check. The initial conditions are uniform spread. All of them are uniformly spread. 
So this is something we did not check how to depend on the initial conditions. So it's uniform spread. It means this is on the list For of. For example, you just look at one initial condition. Yes. Uh, that is uniformly spread. So it's um, and then it means it is a point that will be checked. It means, uh, and this is you f and then you, you, this quantity, if this is correct, is independent of L. So now uh, no one says that, uh, that we should be right. So this is uh, something ch checked in the computer, and so f so here you calculate. This is basically the probability of being regular, and you see it. It basically depends on the sample size, but when you take the L truth of it, and now and uh, that what you find is that it looks like this. All the data collapses on one curve. So it means that you, this is independent of L. So for fixed density, the probability of being re regular is exponentially small in L. And this makes sense. Now, uh, what we did was <coughs> now, <coughs> so this is in some way that's if this is correct for all L, that's great because you don't need to take large systems. This is the problem with numerics. So you don't have to take large systems. You can do all your calculation for a small system and then extrapolate. This is what uh, you would also like, uh, always like to do. That now, <coughs> but this is not all. So now, <coughs> so we can then start. Uh, take a certain L0 that is much larger than Xi, and from now on, see how it depends on parameters. Now, <coughs> we define a quantity Q, and the reason that we define the quantity Q is that P, the probability of being regular, is a function that looks like it's a sigmoid. It looks like a Fermi function. And then, all the action is in this regime. So in some way, you want to make something that is more sensitive to this. Uh, to this uh, what are these different curves? Uh, these, are, these, uh, the, these are the different uh, uh, disorder. disorder. Okay. And now, so then, we were, so, so, so we define a quantity Q, and we will work now with it. That is, it is like in the Fermi function, the inspiration is like in the Fermi function, you want to just play with the Fermi level. That is, uh, and then, uh, so now, in the, for P being regular, uh, so, uh, f uh, so if, it, if, if everything is regular, Q has to go to infinity, and, uh, and that, uh, and this is basically, and then, uh, and the, uh, well, uh, and the chaotic is the opposite case when Q goes to zero. Now, this function, clearly, this problem has two singular limit, limits. One of rho equals to zero, <coughs> that there is no nonlinearity. So that is an, a, the Anderson problem that we know. And when there is no disorder, that's another problem. The, and then, if you have something singular, our experience is that it's useful to write a scaling function. And to make it, as a scaling function that, that is a function just of one ratio, where these are two exponents. These are things that happen at critical phenomena. And now the question, now we don't know this function, we don't know justification, and we check if numerically this happens. And the answer is, that's, uh, the, 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 so that one has to check, so this is the function Q, when you, you uh, 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 this is the function P, now this is the function Q, as a function of density, and now when one plots it in terms of this scaling variable, all the data collapses, and you see you have also two, uh, two scaling regime if you plot it logarithmically so, uh, with this. Uh, uh, so this is the large uh, uh, value of the scaling parameter. This is the small value of the scaling parameters, and one can now extract the various exponents from this. Pardon? That's strong disorder. Well, uh, yeah, okay, as a function, disor so disorder is in the denominator, so this is strong disorder, yes. So, it yeah. so, this is, so this is localized and this is yeah. strong nonlinear. Yeah. It, it collapses for a particular choice of, the, uh, of those exponents, right? Right. Uh, if you, you don't, have choose the right uh, you right have to choose the right exponents. So this. It collapses. If you don't choose the exponents, uh, it does not collapse. Okay. 
So, and the exponents were that, uh, and now let me show you what were the exponents. So the exponents were uh, alpha equals to beta 7 over 4. And now the, now the exponents on the two edges, it's a singular function that has two exponents. One is called is zeta for the small x that will be most relevant for our case in what follows for the small row, and eta is for the large row. And what is uh, important to remember, something that we could not know without doing the calculation, is that uh, this number is larger than 1. It will be crucial. And now... What x is the ratio? R is the ratio between... To the to the beta. To the right power. Yes. And now the prefactors here are two small numbers. And the, the fact that this is number is small will be crucial in what we think why people get, did not get in the experiment, in numerical experiments to the critical regime. Now all this is... Words, it's the reason they have, to, they, have waited, they have to run it long enough. Yes. They have to run longer. And, n and now we really don't understand from where this number comes. But it comes out in the numerics. And uh, it, is, it is quite consistent. So when we change the, uh, by a factor of 10 the, uh, the time that we run, Q changes very little. So now, what do we learn from this? So now, we, look, we want to look at the limit that rho goes to 0. Because the assumption is you spread rho goes to 0. So now, will and then x goes to 0 and q goes to infinity. So then, <coughs> in this regime, indeed p0 that he approaches 1, that is, uh, the, uh, the system is not chaotic. And now we can, we'll see how it approaches 1. So we look at p regular, and p regular becomes uh, a function. Now we can expand it, and it becomes a function of this type. Now we need for the size to see it for the size L. So we raise it to the power L over L0, and we take it to the 1 over Q. Now we substitute the, we substitute, uh, this, the to 1 over Q. Now the probability of being chaotic is defined as the probability to, is 1 minus the probability of being regular. And for small p, this is just the log of it. And then you take basically the log of this quantity, and this is what you find after you substitute the large Q. The large Q was uh, W alpha over the small Q. Now you use the scaling that you find numerically, and you find this form. And now you have rho to the zeta here. Now you remember what is this. Rho is the norm over the length. And now, if you keep the norm fixed and it is just spreading, and you analyze now systems with it uh, spread in a different way, you find basically that the probability of being chaotic goes like 1 uh, minus zeta. So it goes like 1 minus zeta. And therefore, when you substitute the numbers, it goes like uh, 5 to the minus to the 4 negative sign, so that it goes to 0. So then it goes rapidly to 0. So then the system, uh, if you think about it, that if this will be uh, scaled like this when for all type of perturbation, now we, we just to use the one. So if you use the renormalization group analogy, it means it's going, uh, we look to in one direction. Uh, what happens, but you have to check in some way many directions. If this is the case, so then uh, the limit, the large limit of the system is not chaotic. It means, so you cannot, there is no region that will support chaos. Now, so f now how far do you have to go to see it? Okay, so now we take the large system limit, and now we assume, we take uh, for this mechanism, we assume that for this mechanism of being chaotic to work, the, uh, you, you need uh, some, there is some minimal value of the probability to be, 
to, uh, to be chaotic on, on a scale that is of the order of the localization length. So in our case, it was L0. So we say, OK, let's put P mi minimum 0.05. We put this to be, uh, we put then this is the number of order 1. Now we substitute all the numbers. And then L max comes to the order of uh, 10, to the, to 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 4. So this is much further what the people see their region here. They have to stop the simulation where it's about 100. So this is something. So this is the reason that uh, now we don't understand what is the origin of the small number C1. So, so, so but, but you should say what the conclusion is. The the, the, the conclusion is there is no chaos, <laughs> and then, okay, so that will be so. Yes. Yeah, so this is what, you, so, so then there is, a, okay, the, when you're spreading, chaos disappears, and then probably this implies that there is localization. Now, it may be that. Uh, this theory may be too crude to see things like logarithm of logarithms of logarithms or such stuff, but this, the, the w this sub diffusion with an exponent of a third cannot go forever. And I have also another argument against it, against go going it forever, that is assuming that their theory is right, it's in some way runs out of steam when uh, it, it means you cannot be uh, chaotic with something uh, of the, that, that small. Now, uh, to support it, there are independent numerical experiments that uh, are run by Sergio Brie and people that collaborate with him that basically uh, find that as it spreads, the motion becomes more and more quasi-periodic. Now, the technique that he uses it becomes almost periodic. The technique that he uses is basically to see, so it's hard to look for Fourier components. What he's looking is if the function recurs to itself within a regime epsilon. And, and, and from this, he, 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 he concludes that. Now, uh, if you say to the numerical, the numerical people, they, they in some way, uh, okay, they're not convinced by these arguments. So uh, let me maybe summarize with the emerging picture that for small nonlinearity, initially, you don't see any spreading. This is what uh, now, if for strong nonlinearity, some part uh, 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 of, uh, for does not spread. This is something they could not tell. This is a rigorous result <coughs> of a brief lack and, and co-workers. So there is some stuff that gets stuck. And this one can. <coughs> Yeah, this is the yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Asymptotically spreading, now there is. Mm, then, one, there are arguments based on a, a con conjecture for strong disorder by Wei Ming Wang uh, that basically uh, the spreading is at most logarithmic. Now, we, we did perturbation theory and with Avis of Fer and Evgeny Krivolapov, and we look at the remainder term. The remainder term, if, now we did not succeed to calculate everything, and now if some constant there does not get too wild, leads to the same conclusion without the limitation that the disorder is strong. We just need be, be the, the, the nonlinearity to be sufficiently weak. Okay, and now, uh, so, so this is, um, um, okay. Now, the subdiffusion can probably not continue forever because of the scaling theory and because uh, the effective noise theory indicate, if you write them properly, they indicate that when uh, the stuff in this, when this uh, flat region becomes too small, now it doesn't look flat, not that flat on the ordinary scale, then there will be regions of the size of localization length the, that where the, where the motion will be periodic. But you have to go through all these regions in order to get to uh, and to excite the edge. So therefore, in the end, these theories, the effective noise theories, I believe should run out of steam. And now, but what is missing is really in some way, a way to construct some really coherent picture of all this. 
So uh, now I will appreciate comments, questions, claiming why all this is wrong, what is, <laughs> or proving it rigorously, whatever. Thank you very much. No. So if it's, it's independent of it. So you, you don't, for any parameters, you assume Yeah, well, we assume, it assumes that there is a finite ch chain, and you treat it as the dynamical system. But, uh, but one step, you substitute the values, uh, some values of the... Of the exponents, no, they were calculated numerically, with, uh, not relying on the one third. They were calculated, okay, so let me tell you what we did. You see, for all the 